Which we are very honoured to have with us the Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Ireland, who is currently also the Chairman of the OSCE, um, Eamon Gilmore. And he will be interviewed by Concordia Advisory Board member John Negroponte. So please welcome the Deputy Prime Minister and John Negroponte. Good afternoon, everybody. Tanish Tay, welcome to the much, Concordia John. A pleasure uh, to be conference. here with you. Delighted to have you here on the occasion of your visit to, to New York and uh, of this very, very important question uh, conference. My first uh, question to you, and I, I'm sure that uh, many, if not uh, most, of the attendees at this conference uh, associate the country of Ireland with some of the economic and financial difficulties that you have experienced, your country has experienced in recent years. So could you talk to us a little bit about uh, what the situation is, how you've coped with it, and uh, I think uh, we'd be particularly interested also in hearing about the social impacts of that crisis and how your country has coped with those. Well, what we experienced was, I suppose, a double whammy. Uh, the impact of the uh, global financial crisis, first of all, and that was coupled by uh, a domestic problem, which was that there had been overinvestment in property, a lot of speculation, a uh, lot of excessive lending by our banks, poor regulation, and 2008, 2009, that came to uh, a shuddering crash. The net result of that was that it put our public finances uh, into crisis, and at the end of 2010, uh, the country had to enter a program with the European Union, uh, the European Central Bank and the IMF. We had a general election at the beginning of 2011. Uh, that election swept out the go previous government that was seen by the people as being responsible for the, for the crash. A new government was elected. It's made up of the two largest parties in the state, uh, one of which is the affiliate of the European People's Party, Central Right, uh, led by our Prime Minister uh, Taoiseach Andy Kenny. Uh, the second party, which is the second largest party in the state, is the Irish Labour Party, uh, which I lead, um, and we formed a government together. And over that 18 months, we have done a number of things uh, to try and bring about recovery for our country. First of all, we decided, first of all, that we were going to move quickly to recapitalise our banks and restructure our banks, and we did that, establishing a system of two-pillar banks, recapitalising the banks and bringing stability to the banking system. Secondly, we decided that we would work and we would implement the program that we had inherited. Uh, we've been doing that. Uh, the targets that were set for that program we are meeting. Last year, there was a, an objective to get our deficit down to 10.4%. We've got it down to just over 9%, and we're confident that we will get it, uh, meet the target again this year. We have restored, uh, I think, uh, successfully our country's reputation internationally. Uh, the results of that are reflected in an increased amount of uh, inward investment in the country, which of course is hugely important to uh, create and sustain uh, jobs. We have made some changes, uh, secured some changes in the, the bailout deal. Uh, in particular, we got a reduction in the interest rate for uh, state debt. And at uh, the European Council meeting in June, we succeeded in getting agreement for the separation of bank debt and, and sovereign debt. Where are we now as an economy? Well, for the first time since 2007, our economy is growing again. We had 1.4% growth last year. We're projected this year 0.7%, 2.2% uh, uh, in uh, 20, 2013. It's small growth, but it is, it is growth for the first time. We have seen, we've had our best year so far in uh, inward investment. Uh, our uh, trade and exports are better now than they were prior to the, uh, the crash. Big challenges, though, that we face, and you mentioned the, the social implications, we have a very high level of unemployment, particularly among young people. We have a rate of unemployment which is uh, over 14.5%. Now, we count it a little bit differently than you do in the United States. If we were counted like it's counted in the United States, it would be about 11%, but that's still, uh, oh. still extremely high, and particularly because there are a lot of young, young people coming out of college who can't get jobs to match their, their qualifications. That is probably the biggest uh, social um, and economic issue that we now have to face. 
And immig immigration and emigration? Well, What's yes, been the, the pattern there? What's been the impact, Yeah, the, the impact of the high rate of unemployment has been a return of emigration from, from, uh, from Ireland. I think there are two, two aspects to that. First of all, uh, we had, during the boom years, a lot of inward migration yeah. to Ireland. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, and this is a relatively new experience for us, about 10% of our population now are people who have been born outside of the state. We saw a lot of inward migration, particularly from Eastern Europe. A lot of those have returned home, particularly those that didn't establish, you know, put down family roots in, uh, in Ireland. Uh, so that's, that's one flow of outward migration. The second, of course, is among young people, particularly well-qualified young people who have emigrated. A lot have emigrated to uh, Australia, Canada, uh, seeking new opportunities. Now, we hope that they will return again because our experience of emigration in the 1980s was that many of the people who emigrated in the 1980s came back again and in fact became part of our solution because they came back with new skills, uh, opened new businesses uh, uh, and really were a, were a huge part of the, what became known as the Celtic Tiger. You, uh, in addition to being Deputy Prime Minister, are also the Foreign Minister of your country and you are the current uh, chair of the OSCE, the Organization for Security uh, Cooperation in Europe. And so I wanted to ask you if you could uh, tell the attendees a, a little bit about uh, your aspirations uh, and, and, and what you hope to accomplish or to have accomplished during your uh, one year chairmanship. Well, I suppose it's fair to say that the OSCE is one of the less well known international organizations. It was um, it grew out of the Helsinki Agreement in the uh, early 1974-75, played a huge part in the transformation of Europe uh, in the post-Cold War period. An, and an unexpected, unanticipated, if I may interject, by the United States. I'm not sure we fully appreciated when, it was fir when the institution was first created how positive a role it could play. That's right. I think when it was first created, it was created to try and provide a, a dialogue or framework mm -hmm. for a dialogue between, between East and West. Mm -hmm. uh, but then as the Berlin Wall collapsed and the Iron Curtain collapsed, it played a huge role in um, uh, maintaining and sustaining a peaceful relations between states. It played a big role in the Balkans in, in the, uh, bringing peace and working to bring peace in the, in the Balkans. And it now has a role to play. There are a number of areas where there are protracted conflicts in, uh, in Europe, uh, the Caucasus, for example, where there are issues between Armenia and Azerbaijan, issues between Georgia and, and Russia, uh, issues between um, Moldova, the uh, Transnistria, a number of these, these areas. And we've been working uh, to, to try and, uh, and bring a settlement to those. The, as chair in office, we've been able to bring a particular perspective to that because, of course, we've had the experience of the, the Irish peace process, the peace process in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we did earlier this year was we brought uh, the states who were involved uh, in some of these conflicts to Dublin. We had a very good uh, event which was addressed by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland, both of whom had been involved in the whole development of the peace process, and of course Senator George Mitchell, who mm -hmm. played an enormous role in uh, mediating the peace process, uh, and President, President Marty Atasari of uh, of, mm -hmm. of Finland. So we've been able to bring to those conflicts uh, the perspective of a country uh, that um, had succeeded in, in bringing about a successful, uh, mm -hmm. successful peace process. One of, uh, this is a good segue into uh, my next question. Uh, one of uh, Senator Mitchell's successor was Ambassador Paula Dobriansky, who happens to be uh, there in the white suit right now front of us, and maybe she, she should be up here asking these questions, but uh, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about the Good Friday Agreement, how things are going uh, uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, will the barricades come down in the streets of Belfast? How, how, are, how are things going? Well, I think the first thing that has to be said is that the political institutions which were established by the uh, Good Friday Agreement are working. We have a functioning uh, executive in Northern Ireland uh, which represents all of the, all of the, the 
political parties uh, in Northern, Northern Ireland, and that is now dealing with day-to-day -day issues. George Mitchell used to say that one of his ambitions was to take his son back to Northern Ireland and to have him sit in the public gallery of the Parliament in, uh, in Belfast and to have him bored by listening to parliamentarians talking about everyday things about uh, roads and health and education and so on. And that really is what that parliament does. It, it deals with everyday things. We have a north-south dimension. We have what we call a north-south ministerial council, uh, which uh, deals with things on an all-island basis. And we have a working relationship between Ireland and the United Kingdom uh, because we're the, the joint guarantors, I suppose, of the, uh, of the agreement. That said, there are still, uh, Northern Ireland is still in many ways a very divided society. Uh, and we saw this summer, uh, unfortunately, some uh, f flashes of that again, where there were some tensions uh, on some of the, the areas, um, uh, you know, around parades and, you know, parades passing churches and a lack of respect for the, the churches concerned. And we're watching that and we're, uh, we're monitoring that very closely. And we're doing so because we're now entering a period of what we call the decade of commemorations, where all of the big events that happened 100 years ago, uh, the birth of Ulster Unionism, the 1916 Rising, uh, the Irish War of Independence. We'll be commemorating the 100th anniversary of all of these. And there is, it can be a very positive thing, and we hope it will, but there is also the potential that some people will use those anniversaries in a negative way. Um, I will be talking later this evening with the, my, my counterpart, the Northern Ireland Secretary of State, who represents the UK government. We'll be talking about some of those issues and you know, the type of thing that we need to, to do. We do this on a regular basis to maintain, um, if you like, a, a close oversight, really, of, uh, of what is happening on the ground. But would you, how would you characterize Northern overall Ireland. progress oh, no. towards oh. implementation? Is, oh, uh, is this ever going to come apart, or is it going no, to steadily going, move forward? No, no, it's not going to come apart. Th this is a, a peace. Peace has arrived in it's Northern Ireland. This is a peaceful. This is a peaceful country, and I think now what we need to focus our attention on is investment mm -hmm. in both Northern Ireland and uh, indeed in the South. And uh, uh, we have been working uh, in our own government uh, in the Republic of Ireland, but also the government in, in Northern Ireland are working to attract investment into both parts of Ireland mm -hmm. uh, to create the jobs. Because really, at the end of the day, it's you know when people have jobs. Uh, and they have something to go out to in the morning, they're less likely to uh, get themselves into some kind of trouble. I had the uh, pleasure and the privilege of uh, visiting both uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland when I was Deputy Secretary of State. Uh, Paula and I uh, took that uh, trip together, and I can recall meeting all the different political actors in, uh, uh, in the North, uh, as well as uh, the Prime Minister in, in Dublin and uh, meeting uh, the Reverend Paisley. I remember doing that. And I, I remember being somewhat amused uh, several months later when he visited Washington and we had a meeting. And he was uh, promoting uh, participation. He was inviting American businesses to participate in, in, in investment in Northern Ireland, which I thought was a kind of a shift in roles for him, but I, a very encouraging and positive one. It is, and I think uh, the relationship, um, I mean, the, the relationships both between North and South have never been better. The relationships within Northern Ireland, uh, between both sides of the divide, mm -hmm. uh, have never been better. Uh, the relationship between uh, the United Kingdom and, uh, and Ireland uh, have never been better. And I think that that was, uh, I think, evidenced last year. We had the visit of Queen Elizabeth, uh, mm -hmm. first visit uh, to, to Ireland. And they were hugely respectful. There were great moments where uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, went to the, the Garden of Remembrance, which commemorates those who fought for Irish independence, who fought against the British crown. And she bowed in respect uh, in their memory. And President McAleese went to the war memorial, which commemorated uh, those Irish people who served uh, for the British Army, particularly in the, first, uh, in the First World War. So there is this equivalence of respect, and that is, that's really what the Good Friday Agreement was built around. Uh, mutual respect, respect for each other's uh, national, uh, national identities. Um, we can respect each other's national identities, that's a matter of choice. Uh, we work together to build a successful economy, to build prosperity, uh, and to build a better future uh, for the, the next uh, generation. And there is no return 
There will be, there is no return in Ireland uh, to the violence of the past, to the division of the past. Uh, it is something that we work on every day. We're eternally vigilant to, to make sure we don't have that return. And we work to try and get the investment and to build our economies. And of course, we're working together now. One of the issues on which we're working together is on, uh, is on Europe, because uh, uh, my government will take on responsibility next year as president in the first half of next year of the European Council, uh, the European Union Council. And we have uh, working arrangements with the administration in Northern Ireland where uh, they will be, have an involvement in that work uh, with us. Uh, so it's very, very much a collaborative effort. Staying with this subject just uh, for one more question, and given the fact that we have here at this conference and the theme being uh, public and private partnerships, and we had a discussion in one of our uh, panels this morning about public-private partnerships in conflictive situations such as Afghanistan, What's your, what would be your message to uh, an audience like this about how people interested in, in uh, those kinds of partnerships, how they could help in a situation like Northern Ireland? Well, I think, first of all, there are, uh, there are huge, uh, huge investment opportunities uh, in, in, in Northern Ireland and indeed of, of all of Ireland, uh, huge investment opportunities in the development of, uh, of infrastructure, um, in the uh, development of uh, uh, range of uh, industries and areas of, of economy. Some areas of our economy are, are very, very strong. Uh, information, uh, ICT, um, the uh, um, internet industries, the um, uh, food, obviously, tourism. So there are, there are huge, um, huge opportunities. And I think at a practical level, what I would advise anybody who is thinking of looking at that is to talk to our agencies. We have representatives of our uh, agencies, our industrial development uh, authority, our enterprise, our food, our tourism agencies, they're all located here in New York and Washington and they can be contacted through our embassy in Washington or our consulate here in, uh, in New York and they'd be very glad to guide and steer anybody who has, has an interest in you, you looking at what the opportunities are uh, to, the, to the appropriate place. Tanish Tay, I've been given the signal by, uh, by the timekeepers that I've got time for one more question. So if I could transport you to an entirely uh, different area as foreign minister and visiting here uh, for the uh, general debate of uh, the United Nations. Obviously you have deal with many counterparts and are talking with many counterparts about the global situation. I, I'm, I think uh, our participants would be very interested in, in hearing uh, your views uh, and Ireland's views on the situation in the Middle East, particularly uh, uh, the Arab Spring and its uh, consequences? Well, I think there are probably three, three issues. Um, first, the mo first and the most immediate and most urgent one is the situation in Syria. I mean, we are seeing um, the, I mean, a slaughter of, uh, of people, um, a regime which is uh, attacking its own people using its military might and uh, airstrikes. I think it's not, um, it's not the greatest day, uh, the greatest time for the international community. Uh, I think the failure to date of uh, the United Nations and Security Council to agree uh, sufficiently robust resolutions and to be able to, uh, to, to address that situation I think is very regrettable and I think, uh, I think those countries who are uh, holding that up I think need to, need to rethink their, uh, their position. So I think that that is the most urgent issue, is to address the situation in Syria, to uh, get a cessation of violence, and in particular to address the humanitarian consequences of what has been happening there. In relation to the, the Arab Spring, I think that, uh, yes, I think we were all very excited by what the transition of power and so on, but I think we have to be, um, uh, again, I think we have to be careful here that, uh, about what comes after the, the Arab Spring. And I think we have to look at, uh, the human rights situation. Uh, I think we have to look at uh, my, my, I mean, the test that I use, the litmus test that I use is the position of women. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, uh, we, you know, where, where that is going and what type of regime will succeed, uh, I think it's something that we have to, to keep a close watch on. And of course, then there is the, uh, the situation, the continuing situa Palestinian situation, uh, situation with, uh, with Israel. Uh, the hopes I think that many of us had for um, 
talks and an agreement and there was a roadmap when I was here this time last year. Uh, there was a roadmap which was agreed by the quartet. The timetable for that hasn't been kept and that's still smoldering away. And then there's the issue of Iran and, it's, um, uh, and the, nuclear, the nuclear threat. And as you know, uh, the European Union has imposed a very strong set of sanctions. I hope that the three, three plus three talks that they will progress, they seem to start and then they, 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 uh, they, they roll back again, but that's the, uh, that's the other issue. So um, it's, um, there are a lot of um, um, uh, worrying uh, issues uh, generally in the, in the Middle East and they're, they're feeding into each other. So I think that in terms of um, uh, this week's business at the, at the General Assembly, I think that all of our minds are going to be largely focused on, on those issues and I think what we need to do is to get a, uh, insofar, particularly in Syria, we do need to move to a situation where there's a robust uh, Security Council uh, position agreed on that. Well, I'm sure I speak for uh, all of us, uh, Tanish Tay, if I uh, say that we're, first of all, very pleased that uh, there are signs of recovery uh, in your own country. This is very encouraging news. We know that uh, Ireland and the people of your country have gone through a very difficult time in, in recent years. And we also, we congratulate you for the role that you are playing uh, in European institutions, both uh, the OSCE and presumably next year when you take over the uh, European uh, chairmanship. And we were certainly very, very interested to hear your views about uh, the situation with respect to, to uh, both Northern Ireland and, and to the Middle East. So thank you so much for joining us and please join me in thanking you. Uh, Thanks a lot. Okay.